Today, um, she will give a lecture entitled Form Follows Feelings. Let's welcome Suchi to ACSF. You're not amplified. You're simply speaking to the okay. camera. So. Oh, I can speak louder. Is yes. that better? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> All right. Uh, this That's will wake me up. Want to see. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll have to forgive me a little bit. First of all, namaste. Thank you all for being here. It's actually my honor uh, to hear that all of you have come some, from such long distances to be here because I happen to be a New Yorker now. Um, I was born and raised in India, but I've been living here for a very, very long time, and this is my home. And it takes me long enough to get here from the city, so <laughs> I, I understand. And I really appreciate your presence here, and really your interest in um, looking at architecture from this perspective. Because um, truly, aside from you know thanking Tom and Julio and Mike, Mike, I don't see Mike. Yeah, yeah. Mike. Um, for having me here um, and for being such amazing and inspiring colleagues when I've been on juries with them and working with students with them, um, I truly do feel like it's a great privilege to be an architect. Um, and that's the thing that keeps me going through what I know is a very difficult profession, particularly for, for women, women of color, people that are from different places. Um, I don't need to enumerate those instances here, but um, I'm very, very happy and proud to call myself an architect and to really be able to think about um, the range of, with which we're able to affect change in the world. And I'm, I'm fresh from the Venice Architecture Biennale, so I don't know if anyone's been there um, along the, these last couple of weeks. Um, and I will say that um, I'm extremely heartened by seeing how we're looking at all of the different ways in which our fields can affect society, culture, spirituality, individuality, modes of being an individual and a collective. Um, these are all themes that you'll see me exploring in some of my projects. And I'm very, very just extremely happy to be able to share some of those things with you and hear your thoughts about this afterwards. So this isn't really so much about me telling you things. This is really about me giving you kind of an overview of my very large range of interests and you know please feel free to to raise raise your hands at any time during this to ask me a question or to stop me or to um, just wonder what this is all about um so really i think we're here to celebrate what i see as a really unique forum in the world of architecture because it's dedicated to the exploration of aspects of architecture that make it not just essential to how we function but instrumental in who we are as humans and to our embodiment and evolution, both as individuals and a collective. And this, I think, is, is extremely unusual. So I really, again, want to thank you guys for um, creating this forum, for making this happen, and really listening to the executive director of this place talk about this connection of people in place. I couldn't have felt like that was a better segue to start talking to you about what um, I've been thinking about. So over the last two decades, the work of my studio, um, which is called Ready Made, my last name is Ready, it's called Ready Made. And when I started that 20 years ago, it really was uh, a name that I came up with in about two seconds and uh, was meant to show the hand in the work, which for me was important because I never wanted to make work that was uh, impersonal. I didn't want to make work that didn't talk about the human, and I didn't want to make work that didn't show the presence of the hand in it. And that's why it's called um, what it is. And um, as I've worked through 20 years now of, of having a practice in New York City, uh, the work has evolved to incorporate the worlds of architecture, all kinds of architecture built um, all scales of architecture, interior design, um, now in art practice. Um, I've shown in a few art biennales and I'm doing some large art installations, architectural installations that allow me to experiment with some ideas of experience um, 
in a way that uh, more permanent things don't allow me to do very often. Um, and over maybe the last 10 years, I've been really interested in the intersection of neuroscience, art, and architecture, and really looking at how space, architecture, and experience affect us in our brains and bodies. And this is how Julio and I met, um, with our common interest in, in this um, uh, side of our field, and therefore, you know, here I am. Um, so while a box might seem like a basic building unit for us, it never suited me. So you'll see all kinds of things. They won't be in any particular order. I tried to put them in a sort of scale continuum, but you'll see, they'll bounce a little bit. Um, and you'll have to go from small to big to small to big again. But really what I wanted to talk about was this idea that we as architects are trained to be interdisciplinary explorers, multidisciplinary thinkers, and this is our value to our culture. And we, in my mind, are the poets of our culture. And I don't think we should give up this space so easily. I think that happens very easily in practice. And it's a hard thing to keep grasp mm -hmm. of while we are trying to make a living and stay alive and make the work that we are trained to do. Um, but this is something that I find <coughs> uh, incredibly important to hang on to and understand because this, I think, is a value that we bring to our society and particularly in the face of these multiple crises that we face, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's coming out of that, whether it's the rapid change uh, that AI and other things are going to and are continually having mm -hmm. us um, experience, that these are things where we should be at the head of every table where every decision is being made. I don't think we need to be excluded from any realm of any kind of decision-making in society, and this is really a soapbox that I try to get on, and the more people that I can talk to about that, and the more people I can talk to outside of our architecture about that, um, I try to do as much as possible because I think this is extremely important. Um, I think it values our field, it values our contribution, and it also really allows us, I think, to be thoughtful about how we engage with these forces that are changing us. Um, and particularly because, for me, architecture is really this mode of addressing a very fluid relationship between the self and the world. And that <laughs> encompasses human experience. And if what modulates, manipulates, and amplifies human experience is in our hands as a giant tool, I think it's rather irresponsible to leave that unattended and uncared for, or unexploited, shall we say, to be able to really move what we do forward. So um, I guess with that, I'll start talking to you about some of the work that I've been doing uh, and some things that are coming up. Um, but um, one of the other things I wanted to say is that when you go, when I show you some of these works, you'll see, but one of the things that I find um, both challenging and interesting in running an actual practice is that sometimes there are opportunities to have these changes and then there are other times when you just have to make them up. Um, so some of it is some of both. You'll see some things where the opportunity was there and other things where I just had to make it up. And I found a way to, to try and talk about something that was outside of merely saying that architecture is here to help us function. In my mind, architecture is here to help us feel. Architecture is here to help us feel ourselves and others and to really understand who we are as humans. It's gonna take a minute. So, um, so I'll start actually, the first project I'm gonna show you is um, brand new. Um, not unveiled to the world yet, so nobody can talk about it or take pictures or put anything out until next week. Um, but uh, it's a large installation, a solo installation at the National Building Museum. And I'm very proud to say I'm, I think, the sixth or seventh in line to do this installation and the first BIPOC woman to do this. So I'm very excited um, to have this opportunity to be able to look at um, something that's, it's the largest interior space. Um, in Washington, D.C., and it looks a bit like that. So um, I think some of you might know the space, some of you might not know the space, um, but it's, it's a giant atrium that really uses, scale becomes an incredible question because the human is really so tiny in this space, and we're talking about how do we talk about scale, how do we talk about perspective. So in this project, which is called Look Here, and opens on June 30th and is open through September 4th, Labor Day. All of you are welcome. Um, I'm having a reception June 30th, so if anyone's in DC, please, please come. Um, this, uh, I'm using perspective here 
as a method both of self-awareness and of reflecting architecture so that um, we are being conscious both of our environment and of ourselves. So uh, the project is designed as a ramp, an elliptical ramp that leads you to a central space and you look up and see a cluster of um, essentially children's games that are frozen in different shapes because I have this, this theme of sort of wonder and discovery that I like to run through my work. And um, that reflects and refracts this architecture. And while you are on the ramp, you actually encounter clusters of these shapes in which you see yourself reflected in activist matches that happened in DC. So were you not there, were you there? Does it expand your sense of who you are, of who you are as a human, um, what you might be empathetic to, and what you may or may not know about? Um, so I'll show you a few more images of what this might look like and what these clusters would look like. And um, the experience through the space. It's very challenging. So you could have seen us, you know, building 10 foot kaleidoscopes and running around Washington Square Park, testing them to see, you know, who we could get in there and how they could look and getting every passerby's advice on, on how to patent these things and make a living. Um, it's really a wonderful experience being a person making things in the world, I have to say. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited uh, to be premiering this installation in, uh, in June. This is a video, so let me see if it plays for us. Uh, there we go. So this is our the prototype that we tested. So I didn't really know what to do with a space that was this big, that was full of gold columns and many patterns, but I decided that I was going to make more of it um, in order to help us to understand who we are and where we're going with this. Um, so please do come. It will be a spectacle that I think will um, allow people to understand more of what they're seeing and more of who they are. Um, so when I take this kind of perspective to our residential work, I'm really thinking about architecture as communion. And what communion means uh, to humans and as, um, that as a container of most aspects of our lives, architecture allows kind of an unmediated conversation with the other, whether it's nature, whether it's ourselves, and natural elements, our senses, our sense of ourself. And this is shaped in proportion to our spatial experiences. So in this cabin, which is on the lakes, uh, shores of Lake Champlain, um, we actually designed um, a, a building that breathes in the landscape. So it kind of opens and shuts and breathes in the landscape and expands itself, but also has a section that um, orients the human to different views. So you can always feel yourself in a different spatial interaction with different elements of um, the, this amazing landscape that we're lucky to be able to work in. And so we amplify the transcendent nature of this beautiful, pristine landscape through architectural connections, both upwards and outwards, and it's designed to expand and contract. Um, so these are some images of it as it goes into construction. Um, and similarly, in this project, which um, I know Julio knows pretty well, um, since I had built it before we taught together. Uh, this is a project I did um, along with the artist and activist Ai Weiwei, and we did a, uh, an addition to a house upstate, and um, it's a hexagonal addition. We took a hexagonal floor plan and stretched a section, stretched it in section, added two wings, it hangs off of a hill. But again here, what it's doing is privileging nature. And the windows in these long, uh, uh, volumes are actually set, as you can see in this picture on the left-hand side, to be just above your eye. So it's a very thoughtful, simple introduction that's also very austere in some ways that allows you to relate to nature in a very, very, very directed, specific manner that allows you to really feel this difference. So again, you can see reflection is a theme in my work. I'm beginning to realize that, but I, I'm tending to do this. Um, quite a bit uh, in different spaces. So this is what um, that looks like. And this project, which is in uh, development, handles another section of things that we're interested in. And this is about, um, this is called an uh, studio. And what it does is 
uh, combines uh, a hybrid program of being uh, both um, a place where you can learn about agriculture, so it has a greenhouse element, it has an art element, and what it does is creates a space for the community to come together around both food and art to understand both things and uh, creates a kind of a courtyard in which um, external theater and space for other activities can happen. And uh, this becomes really something that can be the lifeblood of a very rural community that doesn't otherwise have access to these kinds of hybrid events. So this is really testing a new model, but this is also testing a full sustainability model that looks at uh, uh, passive elements, it looks at geothermal, it looks at um, uh, sh solar shading elements that we can use to control everything that's happening in the building and to try to make it as self-sufficient as possible. Um, so we're very excited about bringing those aspects in, again, in our interdisciplinary model to this work. And then from that scale, this is just to show you a couple of the kind of other scale that I want to jump to. Uh, this is a project that uh, was, sorry, this is a right direction. A uh, competition we did for a power plant in Taiwan, and this was to take a regular power plant to turn it into a hydrothermal power plant. And this was placed in a very rural area where uh, had a lot of species of native birds, was very special, but there was no um, real uh, economical model for this this place and the idea for the project was to really try to introduce not just something that would make this plant be better than it used to be but to also try to create an economic economic model for it this wasn't in the brief by the way this is what i talk about when i say make opportunities we just look to see how can we do these things that are maybe more than what they're asking for and so what we did here is actually introduce cultural programming, which you see in this kind of secondary platform, over all the maintenance buildings of the power plant. And that became a museum, and that's a museum for birds, that's a museum for nature, that's a different kind of a garden uh, space, a park, um, that we can offer people a boardwalk. Um, and so this could become a tourist destination, aside from learning about nature and power, that you really can equate nature and power in a design. Um, so I'm very proud of this, uh, particularly because uh, my studio, which I'm very grateful for, and my team and their passion and dedication actually managed to get all of this done when I had to go home due to uh, illness in my family. And um, I'm actually really, really proud of what they, what they managed to do um, with very little input from me. So this is also my, my thanks to, to my team and, and how I like to show it. Um, so sadly, it wasn't built, but you know, someday there will be elements of that that, that will come, come together and come, come apart maybe also in interesting ways. And um, this other, uh, this next project I decided to just share with you only because I, I have really been thinking about all different ways, as I said when I started, that we can really think about the world. And part of as my evolution as an architect, my evolution as a person, I think is a place where that's where I want to go. I want to be able to think about anything I want to think about at any scale I want to think about, and I don't want anyone to tell me that I can't do it or that it's not possible. You know, I've had enough of that. So this um, is something that we did <coughs> right after Hurricane Sandy. We had a, a which obviously in New York, we felt the effects of that very, very strongly, and climate change was very real to us. Um, at, a, at a much earlier time, I would say, than it was in most other places. Um, so we imagined actually having a second coastline around the world. This was in a, as a call um, from MoMA PS1 um, to really think about how to present ideas from for the future. And uh, this was a part of an exhibit um, that was held there. And this should be a video that plays as well. So I'm going to give it a second. So the idea was that we could create a second floodable coastline that goes around the world that could conflate cultural influences, that could have bioswales, that could take inspiration from different places that were specific to those places, conflate garden designs, make floodable skate parks, create development opportunities, and maybe think about a different way of understanding how to create a new world 
um, which I do think is really where our value is. And um, I want to keep pushing those boundaries if I can. So these were some ideas. And obviously, it's a very big idea. If we ever manage to build one mile of this, I will be very happy before I die. But I still think this is where we are, and this is where we should be, and this is where we should be thinking of going. So this is something that I felt strongly about sharing with you tonight. Um, and then I come to uh, uh, where we are now, actually, in a project that is uh, sort of the driver for a kind of a research side of my practice, which has now led into looking at different uh, prototypical hospital room designs. It's, we're looking at a giant research um, initiative um, for designing for neurodiversity because about 20% of our population identifies as neurodivergent and really understanding how to design for people. If I'm really thinking about feeling, am I thinking about how everyone feels? And I'm really being inclusive in that way when we were talking about earlier, we were listening to the executive director and thinking about who's at the table and who's not at the table and who's intentionally there and who's unintentionally not there. These are the kinds of things we should be thinking about in every type of design and this is something that um, we're looking at. So this was a project we did in, uh, I believe it was 2019 um, and it was in collaboration with Google and um, the International Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins and what we did is design three different spaces that had the same function, living and dining. And Google designed a band with which uh, we could test four bodily metrics of people just to reflect it back to them to show them that design is not just subjective. This is not just pretty. This isn't just anything. This is actually acting on you all the time. Design is an actor. It's a protagonist in your health and your well-being and your mental health and um, that this is something we should think about. So this is the band. You go through an antiquated chamber, and then you go through three different spaces that had three different um, inspirations. And the first one, I was drawing inspiration from caves. Um, it was, it had real earth wall. And this is a temporary installation, mind you. We built this in seven, seven days, 7,000 square feet. Got it done. Real, real mud on the walls giant tapestry made out of real wool dyed with flowers an 80 year old cactus i can give you because i really wanted the energy of this place to be real for it to not feel like something that was going to fade in a day because otherwise it couldn't affect you in the way that architecture really does so that was the first space and then the second space was what we called the more sort of bossa nova space it was brightly colored we had light coming from different directions and I curated also the activities um, that took place in these rooms. So in the first room had books about cooking and making things. And oh, I forgot to mention people had to be without their devices and for 10 minutes quiet mm -hmm. in each of these spaces so that we could get enough data so we could understand um, what we were seeing. And um, the third space was what we called the sublime space, which was much more te the textural space had light that just came from above. Um, I made artworks in there that would have burned wood, so there was a smell in the room. You could touch things that had a very you know, visceral kind of physical quality. And um, at the end of it, people got to remove their bands and um, their information, their data was deleted, but it was um, processed. And then it was shown back to them as this, a watercolor ring where when their bodies were excited in space, in certain spaces, you would see flares in the space. And what mm -hmm. I thought was one of the most beautiful things about this actually, because the data was deleted, um, I was doing my own anecdotal research outside at the door, asking people what they felt in which space. And I, I got the most amazing information. Um, people who felt like spaces weren't designed for them, that socioeconomically, this was kind of a difficult space for them to be. Things that as architects, we just assume that everyone should be able to walk into any space we thought of for them and they should feel fine. Well, they don't. And the idea is, how do we make them feel fine? How do we make them feel welcome? Where is the velvet rope? What are we talking about in terms of actually making space that actually works for people? And then other times when in some of these, you'll see their flares at the same time, and this happened when People smiled at each other when they were looking at the same thing. And so we know that this happens all the time. Do you have a question? What were the metrics? Um, uh, skin temperature, skin conductivity, heart rate, heart rate variability. Um, 
and there's a there's a video about it on YouTube. I just didn't add it in here. I'm happy to share that, and it's five minutes long, and it'll give you all of the details um, about this this project. And this has led to several projects after this. Um, we've done prototypical hospital rooms now that we're really looking at how we can um, uh, create what we call a physical prescription that can aid a medical prescription. So we can look at maybe changing some parameters in the space that the doctors can adjust so we can see if that could actually work. So this has led into um, a really interesting field of research um, that I'm very, very excited about and hope to see some real um, effects in the world, um, maybe in the next five or six years or so. Um, and then this um, project, which again, Julio and his students were a part of, and Mike, Mike was there as well, um, was uh, an installation that I did uh, at the Smithsonian last year, two years ago, yeah. And it was up for about a year. And this, this is a piece called Me Plus You, and this is an artwork um, we won this as an RFP, and this was a centerpiece of a show called Futures that was looking at all kinds of futures for the world, who belongs in a future, who doesn't belong in a future, all of these questions that we've been talking about. But it was also thinking about technology, because as I was mentioning earlier, this interest of mine that's both interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary includes technology. Because, for instance, I just came from going visiting the Bauhaus for the first time in my life, and really thinking about the hundred years of intense impact that that had because of the technology of its time. And I think that as architects, we're really shy away from technology and maybe all the wrong ways, that there are ways in which to look at it where it's not just about designing parametrically to do something quicker, but there are ways in which technology could possibly be used to help us maybe do our job better. So this was this was an art installation, oh, sorry. Um, so what this does is I asked people to give me a word for their future. And uh, they spoke into these little clusters that you see, and they're all placed at different heights so that they can be accessed by children, by people in wheelchairs, by anyone who's, um, anyone, really. And when you speak into it, you're given, you give a word for your future into this, uh, into this sculpture. It reads your emotion through AI and ML and gives you back a light coding, a pattern. And the piece in the center acts as a kind of a digital loom that's weaving together everyone's feelings so that you know that everything you said affected somebody else. And this is how we work both as an individual and as a collective. Um, and it was very successful, I have to say. I saw the back end um, of all the words that were inputted. Um, I always saw that when somebody gave and you asked someone for their, a word for their future, they stopped to think, first of all which I think is the first thing you have to do with technology is just stop to think about how you're going to use this. And then the weight of the word, because that to me is the piece, that split second moment of mindfulness, of thoughtfulness, that exactly was what I wanted to achieve and I got it. But I also saw that once people said a word and it was maybe dark and they got, you know, some very intense colors, very intense patterns, the next word was better. And that to me, is the argument for what we do and is the only way in which I continue doing the things that I do, which might seem crazy, but seem to have some sort of effect on the people that I'm doing them for. So it uh, keeps me going, as I say. And this very last picture is one of my favorites. Um, I really love how it brings people together of all different kinds, styles, sizes, um, proclivities. It was a really, really amazing um, opportunity and then uh, lastly, I'll take you through a couple of other installations um, that we just launched. Um, this was uh, something that we just did in Milan two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, but this was about um, looking at sustainability actually to talk about something as mundane as a car. And this was done for a car company, but to really talk about its message of being um, fully electric and how do we get to this place and really creating these kinds of green shapes that created a forest that you walk through with sound, with reflection, with light. Um, and what I loved about this was that I watched people walk through the installation and they would slow down. And it was incredible. I got to be up on the top watching them and I would time people kind of going through there. And this was like super, super fast. You know, people would go through lots of things. They just slowed down. 
and they would come back and they'd slow down again. And again, this to me is evidence of the power of what we do and how we can use it to modulate behavior, which I think is extremely important when you look at how we are going to evolve or are evolving. And um, I'm already at the end, which is pretty quick, but um, I didn't say many of the things I wanted to say, but it's all right. Um, um, I'm gonna leave you with a poem and this is a poem that was written by a young poet. His name is Ryle Cape. Um, he's also known as Lionheart. You can find him on Instagram. Um, he was one of the main acts at the Arsenal of the Venice Biennale this year. So if you go, you will see it on these very giant screens where he talks about architecture and writes poems about architecture. And when he saw a project of mine, he reached out to me and said, can I come and do a residency with you? And I said, I've, we've never done that, but sure. And so he came down to the studio and we spent, I said, I don't know if we can do a week, but we can give you a day. And we had a day of talking about our feelings about architecture and what they mean and, and you know, who we are. And, and he wrote these poems and then he performed them. And they are in a book uh, that came out about my work um, last year. And I will leave you with this performance. When entering a space, I know the space is simultaneously entering me. We're in dialogue with each other, permeating each other with an elegant welcome subtlety. Architecture is a delicate complexity, a cannonball flower placed in the gardens of our mind that we are all navigating, thinking we exist in it but it exists in us, waiting to be watered. I enter a feeling knowing form follows closely behind, like a comforting shadow, therefore feelings are always a source of illumination. Liminal spaces create a sort of aperture, absorbing our surroundings. If a resounding sacrifice is a prerequisite for any transformation? What do feelings give up in order to exist? Their silence? Hmm. I trust that there is a higher purpose of space. I enter with my intentions open-minded. Cognition follows only after feeling has tripped over a part of me. Our ability is yet to discern and remove impediments of design, beauty, the becoming of space. Coming to terms with the green thumb our minds are grooming. Are we lawnmower or bonsai artist? My spirit enters for my mind to exit what it thinks I know. I am reminded that buildings are not separate from their maker. The universe is the source of all design. Therefore, the liminal spaces we create must come with a language that transforms us. I leave a space knowing the space will never leave me. <laughs>